All right. So welcome everybody to Science Fiction and Fantasy Read Along brought to you by Paperback Goldmine and IG Bookstore. That's Instagram for those of you that don't know. I am Lou Stamp and right now I am joined by Jill Bryce, a very good friend of mine. Jill, please say hi. Hello. So Jill, what have we been doing the last couple of days? Uh, well, we've been trying to get together to do this podcast, but we've also been reading Savriel. Yep, yeah, uh, it's been hard. Chapters seven through twelve, or six? that is, yep. yeah, seven through twelve. You got it. You nailed it. Yeah. All right. So, if you were new to the podcast, we've only done one previous episode, but you can find it wherever podcasts are available. I recommend that you go back and watch or listen to that one first. Okay. So, anyway, what we're going to do for this episode is we're going to go through one chapter at a time, and we're going to briefly summarize the main points in the chapter, and then we're going to talk about what we learned in that chapter. And then at about the halfway point, we're going to switch over to some kind of higher level. Um, we want to go into more detail for certain subjects. And that's what we're going to do for the second half. And little deep dives. Or something. Yeah, exactly. Deep dives into characters or events or things that were questions that we didn't understand. Um, I've got a really good one for you, Jill. And okay. I, think, I think that you will, uh, well, I think you'll like it. But anyway, why don't we go ahead and get started? Let's talk about Sabriel chapter seven. Let's do it. Okay, so chapter seven, the Mordicant thwarted. Sabriel has just escaped into the tunnel and thinks that her life is over. The Mordicant's arm is reaching through and a charter sending, this magical creature made out of charter marks, erupts from the wall and smashes its sword against the Mordicant's arm, causing it to retract his arm. The door is slammed shut and the charter sending points Sabriel up the tunnel and away. She flees. She makes it to the other end of the tunnel where there's another door and another charter sending who opens the door for her and points out to her that there are some stairs leading down to a huge waterfall across a river. And in the middle of the river, in the middle of the waterfall, is Ab Horson's house. So she knows that the Mordecant was only delayed by the first charter sending. So she goes ahead and she hops, skips, and jumps across that waterfall. And when she's halfway across to Ab Horson's house, she looks back and it's just standing there. The portcullis that the second charter sending had brought down and the ch second charter sending, they're both gone or torn to pieces. But the running water is preventing the Mordecai from jumping. So he's just watching her. So she is exhausted. It's freezing water. It's slippery. She makes it all the way across. And in her panic, in previous exhaustion from trying to run away from the Mordecant, she finally makes it to the door or the gate to the house. Uh, she opens it up and <laughs> there's a cat lying on a rush mat. It's a white cat with green eyes and a red collar lying on a rush welcome mat in front of the house. Mm, Abba Horson. <laughs> Yes, about yeah. time you got here. Yeah, and then she passed out. She fainted because she was exhausted, and then she's just completely shocked by the cat talking. Mentally and physically, I would imagine. Exhausted. Yeah. It's a white cat? Yeah, Moggett's a white cat. Oh, my goodness. With green eyes and a red collar. So That's often, yeah. Interesting. In my head, I picture Moggett as a black cat. Right. I can understand why. Exactly. Do you remember what the red collar, how it was described? Uh, no. It's a Not red a leather collar. Cat. And when she, she reaches down to pet the cat, she realizes that it's enchanted with the most powerful right. charter spell for binding. And and, most, um, yes. And yes. a miniature Sereneth bell. Right. Right. A little tr trinket around the neck. On the so collar. she knows that's not an ordinary cat. She knows. Yeah, she even says, yeah, the cat was no cat, but a free magic creature of ancient power. Yeah, and we'll talk about ancient soon. And also free magic. Like, what's that all about? <laughs> sure. Well, basically, in this chapter, she's gotten away from the Mordecant, thankfully, because that thing was just going to tear her apart and subdue her soul forever. And it sounds, I mean, it sounds nasty, too. Yeah, no, the Mordecant, we went over like its appearance in the last episode and it's not a pleasant creature. Like it got so angry at some point that it was described as like her, she's imagining her equipment down 
Her and pen. she imagines that it's just ash now because the mordicant was so angry that everything around it just burst into flames. All right, so chapter eight. Wait, is that it for that chapter? That's it. Yeah, that's the whole I chapter. Am I supposed to like just let you talk or what? I mean, you're more than welcome to interject. Okay, I wasn't sure. Well, why don't you go ahead and do anything that you wanted to talk about in chapter no, seven? No, I I agree with you, or agree with you from what we talked about earlier, uh, that there really isn't too much going on. I mean, the, the, the chase, the run, the getting to a person's house. So it will get more yeah. interesting in the next chapter. Right. So let's do chapter eight. Okay. Chapter eight uh, can be <laughs> described simply as a bath and a dinner with a cat. That's pretty much what happens, right? Yeah, a bath that she'd rather have taken on her own. Hey, you but know there what? Are sendings? Yep. That are is that what they're called at the house? Yeah, charter sendings. Yes. All throughout the house. Right. Well, we actually we just meet this one. Uh, that gives her a vigorous bath, a rigorous bath, I should say, not a vigorous bath, a rigorous bath. <laughs> that rail doesn't really. Well, she would rather, she's bathed herself for all these years. Yeah, she's a grown woman. I mean, she's 18 years old. And here's this charter sending that like walks into her room and basically bathes her without her permission. Yeah. And I think at one point, is it described in this chapter? I think in the front hands, of a talking cat that she's never met before. Yeah. And the hands are super cold of the charter sending. I don't remember that part. For the next chapter. But I do remember she was kind of surprised and then. Yeah. And then all of a sudden she's naked, getting water thrown over her head. Right, exactly. And meanwhile, the cat just wants to. <laughs> the cat just wants to go eat dinner. So he's like, hurry I up. I was just going to say that. The cat just wants to eat. Hurry up and take your dinner, damn it. So there's not a lot to say about the bath. And there's not really that much to say about the dinner. Other than this is an opportunity for the cat to reveal some information. Correct. Throughout these chapters we're not really learning that much about Sabriel. We're more learning about the world that she's in mm -hmm. and we're kind of going along with her on this journey. So this really isn't her story, at least not this part of it. This is, it kind of feels like we are her in a way, like we know who we are and yeah, we're kind of thrown into this. Obviously we're not necromancers though. I'm just looking at this now. Like she calls a person her She calls her father a necromancer. Yes. Like, why can't he, like, we're necromancers. Like, can just bring him back from the dead. And Mog's right. like, ah, no, 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 no. He's a porcelain. Yes. Don't call him a necromancer. Yeah, he's diametrically he's opposed different. to necromancers. Yeah. Um, the, uh, okay, so <laughs> the information, the most important information that's revealed during dinner, I think, besides just personality for the cat, is a comment that Moggett says, about I have served ten times your age of your predecessors, mm -hmm. which is 180 abhorsons prior to her. And yeah, if I go we're talking about her. the average life expectancy of an abhorson, and I feel it's fairly acceptable to assume 20 years, which puts <laughs> Moggett's service at over 3,600 years. That could well be because in her, when in the previous chapter, when she kneels down and is describing the caller, yeah, it says it's definitely over a thousand years old, yeah, exactly. So it's at least that old, right? Older than a thousand years old for sure, right? So another thing that Moggett oh, yeah. says during dinner is that, old. and he, he knows that her father has died. And he's perfectly well aware whenever one abhorson falls and another one takes his place. And uh, the, it's, the indication that this has happened is the passing of the bandolier of the bells and the yeah. sword. And he said that his aunt had done that for him and now he was doing it for his daughter, Sabriel. And yes. there was not a lot of hope for him to still be alive. So it's kind of a gloomy dinner. Well, yeah, especially for Sabrielle. Her dad's dead. Like, <laughs> and I'm kidding, right? Who she barely ever get, got to see. Or we get little bits of pieces throughout this of her just realizing 
how much she does not know about this side of the wall, about the old kingdom, about anything that's happened, about the history of the old kingdom. Yeah. Uh, anything. She's woefully that. unprepared. Yeah, she's pretty ignorant of all that. She's kind of grown up as a, uh, I mean, definitely sheltered, at least as far as. She asks Mogget why she was sent across the wall to go to school because he made the comment that it was an unfortunate fact that she knew nothing about this position she was supposed to be taking up. And she's like, why, why did he do that? And yeah. his response was that, you know, he was scared for her life. He wanted her to be safe, to grow up and didn't really expect what happened to happen. So, well, but that's also kind of interesting because obviously a portions have been around for quite a long time and it gets passed as we can see a lineage thing. He, well, it is lineage, but not like father, to child right. or mother to child. It can well, be a cousin to a cousin. Right. It might be Whatever. one family line. That's what I'm saying. Definitely. Like there is like blood there, family. but it's not, it's not like the Kings and Queens of England. Yeah. It passed on a little differently. Right. And I don't, I don't know how they decide who it gets passed on to. Like, does she, was she born with powers? I don't think so. We don't really, it seems like anybody can learn charter magic. Even I don't, I don't her- know that that's clear yet. Well, based, just based off of what we know in the books, it already, like in the first couple chapters of the introduction of her at the school, it's like anybody can take magic as long as their parents let them. Right. These people on that side of the wall are like, what? <laughs> or don't believe it or think it's crazy or whatever. But yeah, don't believe in it for sure. So it seems, and obviously the guards at the wall, there are they have chart. It just seems like something that maybe not everybody is powerful at it, but it, maybe if everyone knew how to do it, they could do it. Sure. Perhaps. I don't know. That's just the vibe I Considering get. Considering that she got a first in magic, I mean, it's probably, she probably was born with some inherent magical ability or at least a talent for it because she's grown up with it, you know? Well, she's also learning different magic from her father at, this, at the same time, every is month. She's, she was, well, she's learning about a portion stuff. She's learning, that, she's reading the Book of the Dead. She's obviously learning about the bells. Like, she knows yeah, the but whistling. That's, that's nec- well, the charter magic is the whistling and the sounds and all that stuff. The necromancy is the, uh, the necromancy is entirely separate. She's not learning that at school at all. Yeah, but I also, I mean, we've got the charter magic, the abhorson magic. We've heard of free magic now. There's a lot of magic floating around. It just feels like maybe it's getting accessed in different ways. Mostly all of that magic is north of the wall, too. So it's geographically isolated as well. Yeah. but I, think I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't have the answers. I'm just reading the book. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's why we're talking about it. Exactly. For the remainder of chapter eight, um, the dinner conversation is largely about Sabriel wanting to get her father back and Mogget's trying to dissuade her from even trying. Right. She wants to go to the, the gates or beyond the gates to get her back. Yeah. The dinner conversation is interrupted by dinner and Mogget suggests that they just eat the dinner and then they can talk in the library afterwards. Dinner sounds good. So that's what they do. Uh, this chapter largely takes place in the library and the observatory. We meet the characters there again. They're having a conversation. They're talking about the Book of the Dead and how woefully unprepared Sabriel is. We're on chapter nine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before okay. they climbed into the observatory, when they're in the library, Mogget yeah. explains that a, a messenger from Belisaire had arrived seeking the help of Abhorson saying that an undead had been able to get past all of their wards and was preying on the living of the city. It's the capital city. And again, we find out that Sabriel's woefully ignorant of the world. She doesn't even know that Belisere is a city, let alone the capital. Let alone well, Mogget okay. says it was, or like it would be, if the kingdom was still even a kingdom. So there's a little hint there that not all is well. Right. They don't have a regent. They don't have a king. They don't have a queen. So everything's falling apart. So I don't know if we discussed this actually where she's going, like what her goal is. Her goal was she wanted to know where she needed to, she needs a person's diary. He also had a map. That's how the map came up again. And she was basically 
telling Moggett, dude, tell me what, what, what happened? Like, where did he go? He's like, I don't know. But he describes the guy from Belisaire that came. Yes. And a person left. And that's, I think all Moggett knew or what he told Sabriel. Well, he first told her to go get his diary and she's like, Oh, that's great. Where is it? Oh, he probably yeah. has it on him. Right. What a jerk. <laughs> what a jerk. So that's where she's heading in the paper wing. She's trying to find Belisair. where he died. Yeah, she wants to, well, she's starting at the beginning. She's yeah. starting at the beginning, which is go to Belisair and find out what what's going on. Yeah, you know, what happened in Belisair and go from there. Yeah. And during this conversation, a charter guard or you know, very much like one of the wardens from the gate uh, comes down from the observatory. And yeah, but it's ascending, right? Yeah, they're all charter sendings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one is one of the wardens, though. It's got the key emblazoned on the front and back. Anyway, it beckons them up, and so Zabriel follows, and so does the cat. She doesn't see how the cat gets there, but uh, she notices. At the top of the tunnel, where she emerged at the river's edge, the Mordekant is still there, and now there's a shadow hand, and there's also a bunch of human slaves. And she uses the telescope to see what's going on over there. And they essentially are using the humans to build these boxes, very similar to coffins. And they're staking them with chains and ropes and filling them with grave dirt to build a bridge across the water so that the undead can walk across. They can't walk across moving water unless they have that bridge of grave dirt. So they're building that right now. And uh, obviously they've... Are the slaves human beings? Like yes. live humans, right? Yes. And uh, Moggett even knows where they came from. He's like, they're either from this town or the other. Moggett estimates they have the rest of the night and all day tomorrow before they'll finish the bridge. And so they might as well go ahead and use the, uh, the ritual to defend against what they're doing. Yeah, which they do say at the end, it's raising the river. Yeah. So chapter 10 is the flood. Sabriel and Moggett had gone down into the basement and there was like this block of ice down there with charter marks all over it and the pedestal upon which it stands. And she had simply said, the Abhorson pays respect to the Clare and requests yeah. the gift of water. Yes. And that was it. That causes some melting up in the mountains. Water starts to flow faster and then there's little bits of ice and that meltwater comes down in a torrent, a huge flood. And the little icebergs start banging on the bridge and then they can hear it going tink, tink, you know, hitting the bridge. The next thing you know, wall of water that's almost as high as the walls of the house just sweep everything away. And she can feel the life forces of the, the humans winking out. And she knows that some of them even jumped into the river to avoid yeah. being subjugated by the dead beyond life preferable so anyway that wiped out the immediate threat but that water's not going to go down for quite a long time so yeah, Mogget, weeks. weeks right yeah Margaret has told her about the paper wing little flying machine and that's how she's gonna leave because she wants well, to she doesn't there. know that it's a paper wing yet is that at the like he's basically just like yeah there's another way like your ancestors made another way so she's preparing to depart. The flood arrives. Maga draws a map for her because she does not have one. And this cat is pretty amazing. He does this from memory. She sets out good paper and an inkwell, and he just whips out one ivory claw, dips it in, and starts sketching. And, and does little pictures and illustrations, too. Oh, yeah. No, he's, he's gifted. It and before he does it, it's described, I, I picture it as he's kind of like, Hmm, like he's thinking about it first. He's like, hmm, I'm trying to remember. Oh, that's right. And he just like draws it. Yes, it's pretty hilarious, actually. And well, Sabriel is very appreciative. I mean, she's always very polite. She says, thank you, and et cetera. And Moggett's like, yeah, we, can, we can look at the map later, you know, get dressed, let's go. Uh, oh, but she's definitely in a hurry. And also getting annoyed with some of Moggett's, uh, I don't know, arrogance. And Moggett's kind of annoying. You know, yeah, he's well, this holier than thou cat, you know? Right. Well, he's yeah. Well, she does know nothing. He's obviously withholding information, you know? Yes. But we, there's a, when he's talking about Belisaire and what happened there and breaking, like, 
one of the charter stone one of the main charter stones how's it described the greater the greater charter the greater charter yeah uh he's trying and he can't finish his sentence he yeah, can't he's being get restrained. Out. yeah yeah he's being restrained. anyway okay so um the cover of the the edition that i have is the little eos paperback i think it's the same one you have yeah, right? i think you have the same one and those illustrations are done by leo and diane dylan and it is a beautiful illustration for those of you that are not not aware. It's, it should be the cover of this podcast or the, uh, the thumbnail. Good. Though I can see why they made it blue, but it is described as black. I believe in the book, what she's wearing, that thing with the silver keys on it. Yeah. I believe it's described as black, but um, I like the blue. It is pretty accurate though. But they yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. The, besides the color, I, it's v- very accurate. Are you talking about the, the armor underneath the, the no, like the cloak with the silver keys on it? Like she's all dressed in black. Like there's no mention of color or anything being like colorful. Except for I thought the, it was blue. I don't think so. Look at the bottom of 160. The other sending waved out a gleaming deep blue surcoat. Dang. Damn it. Dusted with embroidered silver okay. keys. So they got it right. Fine. Yeah, they got it. They got it all right, yeah. except that she's not wearing her helmet. Yeah. What? How is the helmet described? I was trying to picture. It's a helmet wrapped in cloth, and it's striped. Oh yeah, it's described like a turban. Yeah, almost. Yeah, it's a cloth wrapped helmet, and it's got stripes. I think it's blue and silver stripes. I would like to see that. I'm sure they existed in antiquity. I don't know what they really look like, but this cover image is beautiful and that's accurate to, you know, the description in the book for the Mm -hmm. most part. Absolutely gorgeous. So anyway, the, the, the sendings, the charter sendings of the house, the servants of the house dress Sabriel and, um, and and just as she's finished, Mogget walks up and vomits at her feet, a little silver ring with a red ruby in it. She says, well, I'm going with you, so you're going to need to wear this. So Sabriel puts on the ring. Do you remember what happened when she put on the ring, Jill? Yeah, she kind of, uh, the way I pictured it was she like fell into another world or fell down into like a darkness, but then like got pulled back out like with the charter magic, I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, like kind of back to reality. Yeah. Like, with the ring. Exactly. She's wearing this ring. She's like, oh, it's, this is free magic. Yeah, but it's not just free magic. It's free magic and charter magic together, which surprised yeah. her. She didn't think that they could kind of coexist. She thought they were almost antithetical. And yet here's this ring, super powerful, super, super powerful. And that was after she put it on. And it didn't even radiate magic. The ring was just mundane she said it didn't she didn't feel it in any capacity which normally she can feel charter marks i was gonna say i don't think it describes the marks as swirling around or anything like it does and no she didn't encounter them until she was like semi-conscious and then she felt the charter magic pulling her back out of the free magic but they were working together somehow yeah anyhow yeah she doesn't describe what the magic says right so that's essentially chapter 10 in chapter 11 um, Sabriel is shown to the paper wing. It's given a really good description. It's, it's like a little canoe. It's made out of paper. It has these folded back wings and painted eyes. And she thinks it's super flimsy and she doesn't really want to get in it and doesn't understand how it's supposed to work. But do you picture uh, it kind of like origami or something? Like, but with the, the paper, like I know it's shaped like a canoe, the middle part, but like, like, how do you picture it? White paper? You know, like thin, like tissue paper? How are you picturing it? Well, she said it was laminated. So it was a bunch of layers of paper glued together, kind of like paper mache, but okay, probably so it's more. Be a little fun. slick, kind of. Smooth on the outside, for sure. Smooth, yeah. Smooth is a better word. Yeah. Okay. But it tapers at both ends, the, the prow and the tail. And it's got a triangular tail attached to the end of the canoe shape. And then those two folded back wings. And it's got those yellow painted eyes. And she breathes on this little mirror inside the cockpit and it goes through this like startup sequence. It teaches her how to control the ship. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. It was really cool. Really neat way of teaching somebody to fly it, you know? It sounds like there were a ton of different things. Yeah, like, but she, it was she, done. she described some and then it, she's like, and then there were more and after it was done. Yep. 
the greater winds, the lesser winds and all that stuff. Um, so she goes through all of those charter marks that are for controlling this plane as it were, and then they're ready to go. And Moggett tells her that this plane was built by her great, 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 great aunt, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Who never had any children. And Sabriel yeah. thinks yes. that maybe this was her child. Right. Uh, Cause it was obviously lovingly crafted. So she enacts some charter magic with a whistle to build up a wind. Yeah. And as it, once it gets powerful enough, she says, let go. And all of the charter sendings at the house that were holding the plane back with ropes, let it go. And it flies, mm-hmm. flies into the night. I feel it wanting to go. I think it describes, it has two eyes, doesn't it? Yeah. And they become alive. Like, yeah, it starts, it like looks up or the eyes come up or whatever. Yeah. Like uh, a hawk. In the earlier chapter, when she was looking at, when she found the book of the dead, she found two books of charter magic that she describes as having, a, I believe, 20, about 20 chapters each. And like after the first couple chapters, she didn't know what the heck was going on. So yeah. like, there's just so much she doesn't know. Yes. And she's like, oh, I'll study a little bit. I'm just like, how much can she actually study? Like, and how much does she not know as far as magic oh, is concerned? And she it's doesn't a hell know of a lot. 36 chapters of magic. Yeah. There's you know? a lot she doesn't know. Yeah. And obviously she knows nothing about free magic, really. really. Yeah, yeah. And that becomes woefully apparent. Well, yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay, so the paper wing tears out of there. And it's like this wondrous thing. And she has this little spat with Moggett that I don't really remember what it's about. But she's so enraptured with flight that she just kind of ignores it and forgets. I think it's the normal thing of like she just doesn't know and he's just giving her shit for it kind of. He's a, he's a little punk, you know? In, as cats in a passive aggressive sort of way. I love him. He's the best. <laughs> he's such a jerk. <laughs> Uh, but they're flying along and they're doing their thing. And Moggett's perched on her backpack, which is mounted behind the seat where she's. Yeah. And I'm thinking it's a one, one person rig. Yeah, it is. It is. Or it's a little half hammock that she's there. flying in essentially and navigating with. And they're following the river and it's like getting nighttime. And, yep. Yep. Leaning way back, like in a sports car. Yeah. And uh, she's not, she's just going about her business and in love with this whole flying thing. And Moggett tells her they can't really fly at night. The paper wing doesn't like it. So they're going to head to one of the islands and make camp. And as she's lowering, you know, she's lessening the wind with whistling and she's coming in for a landing and Moggett's like, look out, look out. There's gore crows. And these crows. That and he's been rich- looking out the whole time too. Or she yeah. like, she was looking ahead and he's kind of like looking around. He, he knew that something would probably be coming. That too, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. But think, I mean, this is probably the first time he's been out of the house in hundreds of years. <sighs> I guess that's true. I didn't She's really think first about that. horse and naive enough to let him out. <laughs> 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 that's probably true. In ages. Yeah. So yeah, he's on the lookout and he says gore crows and they're diving out of the sun. So they were, they were smart enough to use the sun to disguise their approach and they got up nice and high and then they started diving on them. Moggett spotted them and then um, Sabriel recalls that gore crows are crows that were killed by a necromancer. You, get, you take a whole bunch of them, kill them with a ritual and then mm-hmm. imbue all of them with the single soul of a dead thing. Yes. And then that single soul controls all of them. Yes. And their flesh is like rotting and their bones are sticking through. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Gleaming black beaks and white bone, losing yeah. most of their feathers in the dive. And the only way to get away is to push the paper wing farther than she can control. And that's well, exactly yeah, she what starts, she starts. Yeah, getting the winds going. Yeah, she pulls up a greater wind. Which Moggett warns her, nah, you're not going to be able to do it. You know, it's harder than it sounds. And he was correct. Yeah, he warned her before they started. Not in that moment. Yep. In that moment, they're not really talking to each other. Yeah. Well, it's kind of being chased down by a bunch of crows. You know, it's kind of clarifying. Yes. Yeah. So the paper wing starts going at a speed, at a pace, which reminds me of the hot air balloon accident I was in when I was a child. (laughs) It's like the, I swear, it's like the exact same sort of. You guys were attacked by crows? No, but as we were going down for the landing, the winds start picking up. Mm. 
And so the driver of the hot air balloon was kind of getting nervous and he told us, have you have I not told you the story before? No. And we were, it was for my mom's friend's wedding. It was the four of us, my family and the bride and groom in this hot air balloon. We're supposed to go over Napa Valley. Weather was bad. So it got changed over the farmland instead of like Napa Valley. Hell of early in the morning, like four in the morning, we have to get up to go to this thing. I think it was eight years old. We're in there. All of us in this basket, we're coming down. Last one to go up, so we're the last one to come down. We've seen everyone come down. A little van chases them, and they throw ropes over the balloon, and you like come down. So the wind starts picking up, and we're going faster. And the driver goes, um, we're going to have to drag wheat. My parents are like, what? 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 He's like, when I say so, everybody lean in this direction. And... Yeah, so we were going like 20 to 30 miles an hour in this hot air balloon. As we hit down, it like b- bounces and we tip over. Uh, I was going to go face down. My mom grabbed me. My dad was on top. The driver and the groom were on the bottom of the pile with the bride and my mom on top of them wearing no underwear and their skirts were over their heads because they had <laughs> the nylons on. My dad, uh, you know, 230 pounds, was on top of everybody trying to hold himself up like on the bars of the thing. This is as we're whipping through wheat fields and every once in a while we'd hit an irrigation ditch and it went boing and we smashed back down to the ground as the driver's trying to undo the gas so that my sister almost flew out of the basket. She clinged onto my dad's leg and yeah, we survived. I'll never be in a fucking hot air balloon again. Wow. <laughs> yes. It was quite scary, actually. The experience. I bet. It sounds scary. Well, it's it's appropriate, though. It's an appropriate story that you tell, Jill, because we're about to get to a horrible crash. That's true. Well, that's what it made me think of. Like, they, keep, yeah. they just kept going faster. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, nosedive. Well, she loses control. She knows that she's completely lost control. The wind is going too fast. Yeah. Her but whistles every- are not working. No. None of the magic is working. Nope. Even though, even though she knows she's doing the right magic and she's whistling it competently, it's not responding. The paper wing's not responding. They start going straight north. Yes. I can't remember which direction they wanted to go. Yeah. They don't want to go the way they're going. No, they wanted to go to the east or the west or whatever, but not north. Yeah. That's where they're going is straight north and she can't control it. And then I think they end up getting pushed up, 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 up. And then all of a sudden the wind just dies and they, they go into yeah. a nose dive. Yeah, that sounds great. Moggett's like, take off my collar. He jumps onto her lap and he says, take off my collar. They've gotten away from the Gorkros from that big wind that she summoned. They're gone. They got scattered and just disappeared. They took off. Yeah, they couldn't keep up. But now they can't control their descent. So Moggett is on her lap saying, take my collar off, take my collar off. And she's like, oh, geez, I hope I'm not doing the wrong thing. But in He the also back- says, remember the ring. Well, no, he also. does. He does. But she takes off her, she takes off that collar and she yeah. says, feels like lead when she finally, it was really easy to take off, but then it felt so heavy and then it just evaporated, disappeared. And Moggett, Moggett's description, he yes. becomes difficult to look at. He begins to glow white and then he becomes difficult to see. He, his edges begin to blur. And then he's no longer a cat. He has four vertical pillars of white. Right. And one shoots to the prow, one shoots to each wing, and one shoots to the tail. And it must exert some sort of force because it levels out the plane, the, the paper wing. Yeah, yeah. And it begins to slow their descent. It, it exerts this force of several times. And... Slow, Sabriel realizes yeah, they're not going to die. It was like he had to try, also. Or oh yeah, no, the light beams were doing had to work really hard. Yeah, he planned to fucking land. It was definitely an effort. It was I've definitely been an effort. a lot of Veep, and they say the effort a lot. So sorry. You have been watching the Veep, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's okay. I can always blank out the efforts. Okay. I will, in fact, blank out the efforts. So instead of crashing to their death, they merely crash and they come into this. He blacks out, right? It's a, well, it's actually a fairly gentle landing. If you recall, they, they're in a field and they're skimming along and she's like, Oh, we're not going to die. Oh, this is great. This is great. 
and then and a sinkhole. They they approach a sinkhole, and she realizes, yeah. whoa, this thing's right. gonna fall right into it. There's no way they're gonna be able to stop in time. Yeah. So their their salvage landing turns into yet another 100 or more feet descent right. into the sinkhole. Yeah. And a devastating crash. All right. So Jill. Yes. I want you to turn to page 180. Okay. And we'll, we'll look at Moggett's transformation where it says Sabriel felt its attention. Mm-hmm. I was just reading that sentence. Oh, uh, it seemed to hesitate for a moment and Sabriel felt its attention flicker between aggression towards her and some inner struggle. It almost formed back into the cat shape again, then suddenly split into four shafts of brilliant white. It doesn't even say light. It's just brilliant white. Uh, one shot forward, one aft, and two seemed to slide into the wings. Okay, I have a question for you, Jill. Yeah. What do you think that inner struggle is? Uh, well, I... Right, don't answer. Don't okay. answer right now. Okay. Don't answer right now. Then why ask me the question? Uh, because I want to put it into the minds of anybody that's listening to this podcast. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about Mogget. We've already discussed that Mogget is a white cat with bright green eyes and that uh, Sabriel found him lying on that rush mat and then realized quite quickly that it wasn't a, actually a cat. And, and I'm that, still think, thinking of him in my head as a black cat. I've got to get that out of there. Well, he is described as a white just, cat. I know. And in the description, it's shafts of brilliant white. Right. Not, not even brilliant white light. It's just brilliant white. Yeah. Hard to look at. Huh. So he's got that red leather collar and that little bell, that little miniature Sereneth, which is the binder that mm -hmm. hangs from his collar. The biggest bell, I believe, right? I think it's the second largest. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's on page 80. Yeah. Astrael is the last one. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So on page 121, Jill, mm -hmm. Mogget says, I have a variety of names. You may call me Mogget. As to what I am, I was once many things, but now I am only several. Primarily, I am a servant of Abhorson, unless you would be kind enough to remove my collar. Mm -hmm. So we know that taking off that collar means he's no longer a servant. So on page 122, his shadow is described. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Sabriel watched, her trained eye noting that Mogget's shadow was not always that of a cat. But that's it. She doesn't say like a human form or anything like that. Just not of a cat. <laughs> All right. When they're, when they're talking in the library about the Book of the Dead, the cat says, but it isn't always the same book. Like me, it is several things and not one. So... There's some kind of multiplicity to Mogget that we're not really let into just yet. Well, first of all, to preface this part, um, there's a lot of stuff that Mogget knows. And it's revealed throughout these numerous chapters. And this is one of those things that he knows. Do as you will, he said. Why should I gainsay you? I am but a slave bound to service. Why would I weep if it abhors and falls to evil? It is your father who would curse you and your mother too, and the dead who will be merry. Nice. So now I have another question for you, Jill. Mm -hmm. If you grew up never having met your mother in a prep school, very rarely seeing your father, and this cat told you that he knew your mother? Yeah, that's... Though I guess thinking about it, I guess it makes sense. Like if a person loved this woman and they were together, like he, she must have been at the house before. Right. And she so doesn't does even ask. Sense. She doesn't even ask. No, she doesn't. Though I think that might just be maybe a little lack of the writing a little bit. Like, I think it's I think it's a little bit out of character for her not to inquire about her mother. I know she's worried about her father and I know that's not the subject at hand, but it's like she missed that moment. Well, I think I kind of mentioned it in our last podcast where it feels very surface as far as her, what her feelings are kind of right now. Yeah. Where it's, it's kind of more about us learning about what's going on, not so much about her feelings so much. Yes. Plot driven but as opposed to. It is what it is. I'm not, it's not necessarily a complaint. We're just not getting that aspect. Like we don't really get that deep explanation of her emotions about it. Like, I don't know. 
Hmm. Maybe I don't want to. Like, is it a man who don't, can't write for a little girl, you know, or a young woman? Um, how they would react, or just not thinking about how the character re- would react. Period. I don't know. Like I said, I think it's just more of a feeling of the writing in that yeah. particular moment. I imagine I that there was a. I agree with you. I imagine there was a paragraph that was cut out in editing, you know, because it, it seemed like the perfect moment for her to be like, "Whoa, you knew my mom." Mm-hmm. And there's not a there's not a, a wink of acknowledgement there, which I think is a, a little bit unfortunate. It is unfortunate, and it just makes me think, or it, it tells me it's not important. That's what it tells me by well, her not asking it's her about. mom. Yeah, they're just never coming up because it I, didn't come up there when they had the opportunity. Like right, it just makes me yeah again tells me it's not important. Yeah, though it sh- I, yeah I agree it really should be for her. All right, so on page one hundred and thirty-five, Moggett says, "I am the servant of Abhorson." Moggett says, "At last, you are Abhorson, so I must help you." So we know that he's bound to service. That's that's been readily indicated. All right, so there are some sev- there are a couple of things also that Moggett can do that I think we should discuss. I mean, why not? Mm-hmm. Evidence of Moggett being able to teleport short distances. Mm. So he was able to get from the library to the observatory up a ladder without going up the ladder. He was just up there. It's like he he appears out of nowhere, right? Yeah, it says Moggett had once again managed to get between rooms without visible means of support. Mm -hmm. So he can dim door. When they're up inside the observatory, she's using the telescope to to peer across the river and Moggett's like, they're using grave dirt and they came from such and such a place. And this is what they're doing. And he obviously doesn't need the telescope. He, his vision is extraordinary. Hmm. Do you think he could just feel it? I don't know. Oh, here's another question for you. The Mordecant and the slaves and the, what's the, the hand, the death hand. Who, what's shadow the other, hand, I think. The shadow hand who was described really creepily. Yeah. Um, it's like, it doesn't have a body or doesn't want a body. So that's yeah. creepy enough. Yep. Um, are they free magic? I would assume they're not charter magic things. Like, well, they're dead things that have been brought back by necromancy. Is necromancy? I would assume is free magic. I don't think so. You think necromancy is its own category? I do. There's a lot of magic flowing around. There is. There's tons, but it's all north of the wall. The intersection of magic and technology. You know, probably a hundred years ago, there was no difference between those two worlds, or very, very little. And slowly, as technology developed, the boundary between magic and technology pushed further and further north until, you know, it's not, it's not to the wall yet. Well, it sounds like it had something to do with the kingdom falling somehow. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Probably lack of communication between the two sides or something. I, I don't remember how long they said it had been, but it is a while since they've I had a king or queen. Like- 20 years or something that was the regent he said there had been no regent right for right, right. maybe like a hundred years or something it's been a while yeah, yeah it's been a while and all the while you know the kingdom has been falling apart the charter marks have been being destroyed one by one and yeah. it's getting worse and worse for the people that live in the old kingdom Moggett mentions that without i don't know if he says like bloodline or like the the line of the kings or having a regent or whatever makes the charter the greater charters or the charter stones like way more susceptible yeah i don't know why i assume it'll be explained i'm just throwing out what we've are what we've been told that's all right. i'm saying the right. of discussion but back to mogget okay so uh, back to mogget we know that he's got extraordinary abilities he drew that map from memory his his right yeah dim door around inside the house and his ability to see really really far away He's a pretty amazing creature. Um, But now why don't we switch over to the things that he can't do? Okay. Because there are certain things he just can't say. There's information he tries to give to Sabriel, but he fails. He can't do it. And it happens three times. Yeah. And what in regards to what now? Just his general history, wasn't it? Or Well, hold on. Let's magic. When he's trying to explain Oh, it's, it's exactly that part where they're talking about there's been no reg- no king or queen for 200 years and not even a regent for 20. That's why the kingdom sinks day by day into a darkness from which no one will rise. The charter crumbles too, he mewed. Without a ruler, charter stones broken one by one with blood. One of the great charters twi- twist, twisted, and he 
can't go on. He can't complete that sentence, right? Also on page 142, oh, it says it's in the it's in the middle chapter, but Moggett was silent as if the thing he'd already said had stopped his mouth for a moment. He seemed to be trying to form words, but nothing came from the small red mouth. Finally, he gave up. I cannot tell you. It's part of my binding, curse it. Suffice it to say that the whole world slides into evil and many are helping the slide. So he tried there again and couldn't do anything. And then on page 148. Well, stop for a second. The bindings must be so powerful because, and I'm not going to get into the chapter we haven't done yet, but he says, I cannot tell you it's part of my binding, curse it. Like he's upset that he can't tell her, which would just be helping her. And But there's this struggle, like why, if he's bound why would he want to help her so the the magic that makes him want to help her must be so powerful to I, make yeah. him even feel bad for not being able to say it yes yes you see what i'm saying like i that's, do i do kind yeah. of crazy all right so on page 148 uh, sabriel asks why can't you tell me more the binding and the cat responds a a perversion of the the g- g- yes mm, he can't he wonder just, what that g is for I don't know the per- uh, the greater yeah. charter. I yeah. assume it's the greater charter because he said something yeah. about a greater charter earlier. Anyway, yeah. so anyway, he's bound and thereby cannot inf- you know, he cannot inform her of everything he wishes to inform her of. Um, it's got to be something to do with that collar and the ring, but uh, we don't know what it is yet that he can't explain. But that seems cra- also crazy to me that the slave, I'm sorry, servant of of Horson can't speak freely to a person like why would any information be be being blocked from sabriel i don't know like is it just a story trope or you know like is it just a to be a function of the story or i don't think so because he's very gifted when it comes to revealing information he's really good at it um he is he knows when to deliver information and he's already created all of the rules. But and I mean, the things that he can't tell her, why? Like, well, I think why? Nix knows. Nix knows why, but he's not going to bother to explain it to us. Not here anyhow, because neither of the characters can explain themselves. I don't remember if we get that explanation or not. I just, I don't it either. It feels almost more like a way, you know. All right. I'm going to ask you a question yeah. later on. Yeah. And when I do, I'm going to remind you of this moment about okay. revealing information and being good about revealing information. Yeah. All right. So that's pretty much everything we know about Mogget, except I just want things to make sense. That's all. No, that's that's fine. That's fine. So we're yeah, going to from Mogget. Mogget has just turned into four pillars of white and has helped stop the plane's fatal descent. All right, so this begins chapter 12. They've just crashed at the end of chapter 11, and chapter 12 begins with Sabriel becoming conscious. Um, she doesn't immediately remember that Mogget has been loosed. And so she lights some candles, and she starts to look around. She's achy all over. She's got whiplash. She can't see. But she realizes when she lights one of those matches and lights a candle that the floor is made out of stones that have been worked by hand. Yeah, like paving stones. There's grass. Yeah, grass growing in between. And they're in the bottom of a sinkhole. And she thinks to herself, why would anybody do this down here? Yeah, exactly. And then she notices the paper wing is destroyed utterly. And she's like, she's rueful about the whole thing. She knows that she just took it out and wrecked it the first time. She talks to it, too. She's like, oh, maybe I'll make you someday again. (sighs) Yeah, maybe I'll repair you. You know, what is the... No, I think she said, like, remake. Like, make another one. You are correct, but I'm in my mind. In my mind, I'm like, you dumb girl, you need to fix this one, because... Yeah, but it sounded like it was burnt to ash, is what it sounded like. Well, it only burnt to ash after Mogget approached. Mogget walked right through it, and it caught on fire and destroyed everything. So the... Yes, exactly. Mogget, yes. So she's thinking, hey, where's Mogget? And then Mogget, like... Mogget kind of comes out from underneath the paper wing, catches the whole thing on fire and tells her that he's going to kill her. It's like, I'm going to eat you now. I'm free, but for the blood price is what he says. Yes. And she's like, Oh, that must mean me. (laughs) She knew what that meant immediately. Yeah. She knew what it meant. Um, so she, she tries charter magic on it. 
zing, zing, zing. I don't remember the words, but she cast three charter spells at it and they just went right through Mongit. No effect whatsoever. I had the words right in front of me. Annette, Kalu, Furhan. <laughs> it didn't yeah, work. I, none of them. They don't do anything. It laughed. So she's like trying to reason with Mogget on an emotional level. And she's like, Mogget, but you just saved me. Why are you attacking me? And it just streaks out an arm and smacks her across the face, possibly breaking her nose. And he's like sentiment, a memory removed. Right. Yes. And he's just, he's approaching on her and she's like, Oh no. And then that's when we get, he turns dark because she's like, I can't see. I think that might have been before because she had this, it was before it was when he was further away. And then he was starting to go out and she had this stumpy little candle in her hand. Yeah. And by the time he gets to her, the candle is out and he's on her. Like he yeah. has slapped her and has now grabbed her. I think. Yeah. He wraps her up in his tendrils and she sees that his skin is like constantly moving. Like he's, he's a thin black membrane with thousands and thousands of insects underneath it. Like the, like Oogie the Boogie monster Boogie from A Nightmare Before Christmas. That's just the Oogie Boogie Man. Yeah, the Oogie Boogie Man. It's the Oogie Boogie Man. Uh-huh. Yeah, but not in a potato sack. So Savriel is able to deflect one of his attacks, one of his many armed attacks with her sword, but it doesn't do anything to him. Like nothing. Well, that does slice through. Like it reacts, it but deflects. it doesn't hurt him. No, it just deflects his arm. That's all it does. Describing it as it at this point, because it is definitely an it yeah Mogget. Yeah. we could just say Mogget, i guess but it yeah. does wrap her up and that is when she's scanning her mind desperately because she yeah. knows it's about to pluck out one of her eyes yeah and he wants to torture her slowly yeah of the, because of the thousands of years over thousands of years of a horse and I think I agree it's 3600 years and i mean whatever the number a very long time of being a slave yeah compelled for that for millennia with really as we talked about earlier no free mind it seems like no Uh, like anyway yeah so yeah he's about to kill her and she's he's just enjoying it you know he's got her all exactly where he wants her He's a free, he's a free, free magic creature. You know, he probably just, stinks. He's probably, well, he's not dead, right? Like, well, we don't know. He's a free magic thing. Like we've seen the charter sendings mm-hmm. and we have seen dead things. Yeah. Now we've seen this free magic thing. Yeah. Which I assume is not, he's not like a dead being brought back by a necromancer as far as I can tell. No way. He's like pure oh. magic. Yeah, it's it's just interesting. I think it's a creature created. You know, it is an elemental essentially. It's its body is made it's of magic. The early times, prehistory of the world. You know, it's uh, Genesis. You know, he's from that time. You know, that the beginning of the world of the, what we know as Earth. However, you want to think of it. I don't know what you're talking been around, about. Around Mogget has been around. I'm thinking for an incredibly long amount of time. Yeah. Probably since the beginning of time, so to speak. Well, certainly, certainly many, many years. Beginning of magic, whatever. Right. Well, he's got her exactly where he wants her, and he's going to kill her, and he's going to torture her, and he's going to make it really, really horrible for her. Wait, let me interrupt you again before we get to how she... No, I'm just kidding. Keep going. (laughs) (laughs) That's when she's scanning her mind, and she finally, finally remembers the ring, but she doesn't know what to do with it. But like once she thinks about the ring, it kind of loosens on her finger and then she's rolling it with her thumb and it gets... Well, it just starts getting bigger. It just starts slipping off of her finger and she feels it getting bigger as it's slipping off her finger. Right. And like once it's off her finger, it's like big. It's becoming a torque and then bigger than a crown and then... Probably like the fake rings that they used in Lord of the Rings for certain um, perspective shots even. Right. Another Lord of the Rings callback. Right. Nerds out there. Anywho. Uh huh. The Very movie. ancient movies. I did a book reference and a movie reference. Yeah. Okay. Well, once this thing is the size that it is, a hoop, as big it ring. were, yeah, a very big ring, she realizes all she needs to do is flip it up over the creature's head, and she does. Well, she, she hopes that that's what it's going to do, and it she does. She tosses it. She, she tosses, tosses it. it. I mean, she doesn't do it with any like certain precision. She just tosses it with the hope and a prayer 
And I think that it's probably, um, it's probably magic yeah. enough yeah. that it yeah. helped her out because there's probably. no indication that this girl's a gifted basketball player. Right. Exactly. You know, she tosses it, you know, from a point where she, her arms are bound at her sides. She tosses this hoop up and it goes over the head of this creature whose neck is elongated and it's trying to open up its mouth wide enough to like suck out her, you know, her eyeball. It's like it's, it's coming down yeah. her like it wants to eat her. Probably like part Dementor for any Harry Potter fans out there. Yeah, that's like reasonable. Try to picture it, at least that part. But it's more, to me, it's not, but not so substantial looking. And also yeah. way more like big and maybe like smoky and elongated with like super long teeth with like dripping magic and well the adventures yeah. are definitely undead huh the, oh the yeah, yeah yeah i'm just pick just for a visual yeah but it starts getting smaller or shrinking as it's going down around its mogget's neck and yeah. just, like eight different arms or tendrils come out to try to get the thing off it's not that doesn't work nope doesn't work it just keeps slipping down and down and down and shrinking down and so does mogget and mogget becomes white again and gets compressed into like a, a tablet shape with a yeah, or like an oblong ball or something with yeah. the thing with the collar around it right and then she's like okay there's got to be something else i have to do here which was what well she remembers the bell yeah Sarah right takes it out which it's like the heaviest bell yeah it, it feels super heavy she can barely take it out is how she describes it which is crazy it's probably not like that when it's in the bandolier it's probably easier to carry than it is to wield yeah i imagine in my that. mind like a sort of like back to a D D reference i could see that being like a magic item sure a magic bandolier yeah with a difficult bell to wield right but she rings that bell yeah. and in so doing it turns Mogget back into a cat, the ring back into a collar, and Mogget immediately vomits up another ring. Yeah, and also the ring or the collar uh, creates a little tiny bell also. It recreates a little the little Mogget collar. Yeah. yeah, so he's back exactly like he was. And that is, that is where the chapter ends. Does he say anything? I can't remember. <laughs> I remember. No, she just says... Welcome back. Oh, Mogget. he just gets back to normal. He says, your nose is still bleeding, said a familiar didactic voice. Light the candle, pinch your nose, and get some blankets out for us to sleep. It's getting cold. And Sabrielle just whispers, welcome back, Mogget. All right. So He's strangely, to me, kind of almost a little too on board with this, <laughs> like immediately almost, just with that uh, last sentence. Like, that would oh. definitely freak me out. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a question for you, Jill, and anybody yeah. else listening. And this was something that it, it was during the third reading that I think I picked up on it. That section that I had you read earlier where Sabriel felt its attention flicker between aggression towards her and some inner struggle, and I asked you what that yeah. inner struggle was. Yeah. All right, so when that paper wing was crashing and she took off Mogget's collar. Yeah, yeah. He had a think? moment. What do you think was going on in Mogget's head? Oh, after, I, after having read chapter 12, what do you think was going on in Mogget's head? Well, he did. I mean, there's a sentence or two where it is described. He had, definitely has a moment yeah. of like probably just ditching out, either okay. consuming her or just getting out of there. Do you think that the plane crash would have killed him? In Mogget form or non Mogget form? Either. As a free magic being, I'm going to say no. I agree. I don't think he's at risk at all from the plane crashing, but she is. Yeah, in my mind, he could probably just like fly away or something. Like, I don't. So, Mogget the cat, remember, Mogget's compelled. Mogget the cat is compelled to help I her. No, but to, in he, my mind, that's because of the charter magic, because of the collar. Yeah, yeah. So I think what happened was he realized she was going to die and he knew that the only way to save her was to release the collar so that he could use the power invested in his other form, his non-static form, to prevent her from dying because he needed to help her. Here's a different question for you then. Okay. If he knows that he needs to help her, why like there has to be some selfish reason then too, there is right like there has to be oh there is yeah 
Do you want to know what I think it is? Sure. Because I don't remember. <laughs> Mogget the cat wants to save her life. Mogget the free magic creature needs her. He needs to sacrifice her to pay the blood price to become free. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So Mogget releases himself, and then the other creature, the, his free magic form, is compelled to save her because he has to be the one that kills her. Yeah, that is the reason. And there's a ritual to it. It's not just he kills her. Yeah. There's something going on there. Mm-hmm. So no, when he gets yeah, on the ground, right. he says, free but for the blood price. So right. Uh, speaking of himself, not her. Like, speaking of himself, he's free, except... For yeah, he except he, the blood price, and, and she is the blood Which price. Which I assume is kill a person, because that's who made the spell. It may just be that it has to be the current abhorson. That's what um, I'm thinking, because that's who, in the magic's mind, made the spell. Right, but you remember how we were talking about he's really good? Well, I said that he was really good at delivering information. Yeah. Like, he did all of that very subtly. Like it's, yeah. it's all there. Everything's there. I think even the plucking of the eye, I think that's part of it. I think there's a ritual that Mogget has to perform while killing the Abhorson. It's not just enough to kill Abhorson or he would have done right. it right away. There would have been no thought. There's right. No thought. Let her crash. No, he would have killed her in the air before she even crashed. Well, yeah, true. He would have just done it right then and there and been free, but he had to do it in the particular order. And I think it begins by plucking out one of her eyes, which he mm -hmm. never gets to do because she got that hoop, thankfully over his head just in time. Yeah. got that ring off. But I think that's the inner struggle. I think he just wanted to kill her and he couldn't and he knew it. And that's why he had to save her life. And Mogget the cat was smart enough to know that he would have to go through that effort. And so she had a chance. It wasn't a guarantee that she was dead. Right, so was, right. I see what you're saying. It was a calculated risk that the compelled Mogget had to take. That's why the ring is there. Like, yeah, she... Mm -hmm. mm hmm But he's also compelled to give her the ring, you know? Like, if they're going to travel together in the, in the real world, he has to throw that ring up so that she can control him. Mm-hmm. And she did. And it was extremely fortunate because it would have been a really short book. Well, yeah. And, and not a yeah. very good one either, you know? It's just well, like, she runs away, she runs away. She, oh, she's dead. Well, and we've learned nothing. <laughs> Congratulations, Garth Nick. So you've written a very excellent book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, so we get to go on. We get to move on. But that is the end of chapter 12, which is the, the second part of this ongoing podcast. We have, what, three more parts? 500 pages essentially. So three more, three more sections roughly that we'll probably end up doing over the course of time. But anyway, Jill, what do you think? Yeah. I thought you had other things you wanted to do. Oh yeah. We wanted to talk about the charter sendings. Yeah. I think that's it though. I don't think there's really anything else that I want to talk about. Okay. This, it was this just episode. mainly Mogget. Mainly Mogget. Well, he's obviously the most interesting character in the, in the series right now. Yeah. Well, he's the yeah, only character only that's being revealed. Her. Exactly. And right. barely. Um, the, whenever you've got, it's true of movies, it's true of books, it's true of comics, it's true of stories in general. The origin stories are always very interesting because they're revealing the rules in the world mm -hmm. as well as characters. But like, it's a lot of revelation and revelation is really fascinating and people spend a lot of time doing it. I like um, world building. Yeah, it is. It is exactly world building. We're learning the rules of the story and we're learning about the characters and it's fascinating. And a lot of times second books or second episodes or second movies, you know, they, they kind of fall flat because we've already had all of the reveal and you know, then yeah, the author, not interesting. it isn't because the author has to rely on storytelling. And a lot of times they're not as good with storytelling as they are with creation of world. But, um, so anyway, that's, that's what we're getting now is we're getting a lot of revelation. So we don't really know yet if, you know, the second book, third book, fourth book, fifth books are really, really fantastic based on this so far. But like, I was willing well, to keep I've read going. i the second and third one. I don't know what I have to say about it. It's just, she's kind of in a bubble right now. We're yeah. doing a lot of world building. Yeah. All right. So let's talk real quick about the charter sendings because they are not 
they're not super important, but they're kind of prominent in these. Oh, but it's interesting. It's they each, there's so many of them because each of portion makes their own. Yeah. So some are, and some kind of fade. And I forget the word that Moggett uses. Recalcitrant. Recalcitrant, which is what uh, I am. <laughs> We're all, you get, they get stuck in their ways. They don't like, they, they're resistant to authority. They, okay, resent, what... they resent authority. So they don't like to be told what to do. They have their own way of doing things and that's how they're going to do it. Yeah. And that's the best way. Right. So what we do know is that there were two that she referred to as gate wardens, which were at the long cliff and then at the river edge. There was the lower gate warden, which was the one that was male and obviously very strong and had the sword and defended against the Mordekent down at the lower gate. Um, it was not one person when she was able to see after uh, sh her eyes got messed up from a flash of light. But um, when she was able to see again, she noticed that it wasn't one person. They weren't always male. They were just all large, strong soldiers. And they were all, you know, basically sharing one body going through a series of different visages, but all essentially wearing chain mail. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're defenders, and they've got the key emblazoned front and back. They're able to interact with her. They, help, they offer her a hand to stand up. They can't speak, but they do point, so there's some sentience there. They know what needs to happen. They're like, go that way, but they can't say anything, so they point. And one of them but points. Are they like what? ghosts or just purely magic beings, like a, uh, I don't know. The ones in the house are described like you can't see them or their hands are like oh i've got that don't worry like moon rock they're they're see-through basically with charter marks marks all on them so i i picture them kind of as ghostly i guess yeah but yeah, he says their hands are carved with moonstone the ones in the house have hoods and cloaks and stuff yeah they're dressed differently well the the top game war oh, that's what i'm saying so the wardens do you think they look more like ghosts as compared to like the cloaked old sendings in the house where you can only see their hands and their see-through and you can't even see their faces? I don't know. Um, I, I was under the impression that they were all relatively the same. Like the parts of their bodies that you could see were all relatively the same, probably as he described the moonstone with the charter marks, you know, kind of faintly on mm -hmm. the top of basically a translucent blue stone. So just weird looking ghosts. Yeah, but they're probably not but ghosts. More substantial. Like more solid. They're definitely solid enough to wield a sword and That's do true. damage and to the Mordekin. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And they're, they're sustained by magic. So even when they're destroyed, they'll come back eventually when the charter magic recharges is what hmm. it was described as. But there's the two wardens. The one at the bottom was the one wearing the chain mail and with the sword. The one at the top was dressed like a monk. It had a habit on. And that's the one that pulled down the portcullis. Do you and think they make them from people they've known? I think the pe I think they are the people that yeah. they were. I think the people that cast their their magic or all of the different people that they are. You think so the like, sendings are the people who cast the magic, like the like in the house, the other portions? I don't know. What I mean is, I think that like the image that they take the the face or whatever is probably of the person that made the spell. Don't know. Maybe maybe all those faces are different abhorsons. But I do feel like the ones in the house are different than the other the They don't have the key on the front and back. No, and they're also described again as more kind of or less they're described with less characteristics than the other ones. One yeah. of them has the uh, cream colored habit. The rest of them are not ever given a color. So their habits are just probably, you know, that bluish gray or whatever. Mm. but none of them have faces. They're featureless. They offer their hands when they kneel to her in the beginning. And, you know, that's, she's like, Oh, rise, be cool. You're awesome. I thank you. And, um, they go about their business, but they're obviously curious. They show up at the door to look at her because they've never seen her before. And Moggett's like, yes, it's your new mistress. Let's get back to dinner. Come on. Yeah, so, and, yeah, and Moggett, he's like, I've been having to eat in the kitchen for two weeks. Yeah, because no, no abhorsen present. Um, so they have personalities. They can answer questions, too, but they can only pantomime. Right. Or point or nod or whatever. Um, 
the one, do you remember the one that came down from the observatory to get their attention when they were in the library and he does that weird snake like thing with his arm and Mog, uh, Mog, tells her what he's talking about, but she thinks he's making this like snake through the grass and she thinks it's funny. But oh, he was describing the, the river. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He was telling her about the defense for the river. He's like, you got to do that thing. <laughs> go yeah. do, go do the thing. And she's like, oh, that's hilarious. And Maga's like, it's not funny. Let's go. Let's go do the thing. <laughs> Pay attention. Yeah. Learn quick because it's sink or swim time. Poor girl. The one that came down from the observatory was also a warden. It had the he, had the, he had the keys on front and back. Um, but the rest of them are referred to as house sendings. And yeah, there's, there's just not much else to it. Like, yeah. I think it's fairly common though. It's got to be. At least in the abortion world. Where else have we seen them? It was her mother. It was her mother or what she is. She was referred to to as a charter sending, wasn't she? That's what I'm, I think so. If I remember correctly, yes. And again, I don't even know. It was described as it wasn't even necessarily her mom or even in the shape of her mom. I don't even. I bet you money. I know what's going on there. Um, I bet you that they are cast by a charter mage and they are where they were when they cast it. So like they cast it on the location and that's why Sabriel can only see her mother in death because her mother cast that when she was dying or dead. Interesting. Cause it doesn't make much sense for like a horse to make some sort of spell for her to talk to her mom if she has to go into death to do it. So that makes sense. I mean, that would be the person who did it and not somebody else. Anyway. But why they change appearances, I don't know. I don't know. Unless, you know, other others can come by and, and like, bolster the spell's strength. You know, the first mm-hmm. person that cast it 100 years ago, the second guy comes along and says, let's make this a little stronger. And so he imbues it with some of his power, so it takes on some of his visage. Perhaps. And maybe they just keep adding to the power. Because he was a pretty powerful guy, um, but, you know, ultimately the Mordekant just had to get past them. Right. Can't yeah, they weren't going to kill the thing. No, they can't destroy. They can't destroy each other. Period. Um, it has to be the noonday sun or running water. I believe for the Mordekant, too powerful for anything else. Mm-hmm. Pretty good though. Um, I I enjoy reading this book like four There's times. A lot I don't remember um, as far as some of the details that are to come. There has to be. Uh, what were we talking about before going back to the whole bloodline thing like there's obviously something to me there's something definitely connected to bloodline the regents the falling of the kingdom like Mm -hmm. there's something bigger sabriel is going to have to do than just find her dad's dead body oh yeah what's the mystery we We don't know got there yet no we haven't even gotten through the an inkling of it we've got little drips and drabs of i think we got the most with from Mogget just saying the kingdom has fallen obviously it used to be powerful and have a king or a queen and all this stuff and it does not do you think that uh we're too far along and we're two-thirds of the, no we're two-fifths of the way done with the book do you think we're not far enough along considering that we're two-fifths of the way done Mm, having not read the book in a while, I can't necessarily answer that question until I finish it because it might be fine based off of how it ends. I remember loving this book. Yeah, I remember really enjoying it, but I don't... Um, I don't ever remember I being... Never, like, I didn't dive deep into it or anything. I just I enjoy the story. You're not supposed to dive deep in What we're doing is an abomination to literature. Well, yeah, so like like the whole mom thing. Like I do think that's kind of an error. Honestly. I do too. I really do. It's it's a it's a character error. Yeah. Gabrielle. Would have been better off not mentioning it. Again because it's just not a like it just shouldn't have even been mentioned. No. Nope. Trying to make it dramatic. He was trying to have Moggett have a dramatic line to but it just it's a, that didn't work. It was good enough without the mother that I think they could have just cut that line out entirely. 
Yeah, and I honestly, had, all it I, did was make me come out of the story and be like, why doesn't she ask about her mom here? Yeah, and I can't remember if her mom gets brought up again or if it matters. I cannot remember. Considering honestly. that she just talked to the woman that's like her mom like four hours ago and then ran for her life ever since then. She literally just had a conversation I with just, her mom. I, what I meant was like to the story though, by the end of the book, I can't remember if it comes into play again or not. Like if her mom is important at all. If her mom isn't important, then that line should have just been cut. Yeah, yeah. I also don't remember. Yeah. But it's fine, you know, this is not, whatever. Uh, it's 10 years after his first book, so he'd been writing for a little while, but it's, as far as I can tell, it's a very, very good book. Um, very entertaining at the very, very least. And that, the more I've been thinking about it, the more I feel that it is safely into the young adult realm. Well, I just, just based off of kind of how it's written in like it could be more detailed like you know the font could be smaller and this book could yeah. have so much more detail in it yeah but does it need it you know doesn't like, need it not no. no um oh that was the other thing i was wrong about golden hand um i had said in the last episode that i did i thought it was forthcoming and it is not it's been out since 2016 oh okay so I was just unaware of its coming and going because I haven't even read the uh, Clarial yet. Um, I imagine I'll just read Clarial after we're done with the three books. Do you know what I mean? And then why not just be fresh with them? Have them all. Yeah. No, same here. Yeah. I'm looking what's forward to it though. What's the second one again? Ariel. Wait. What's the Lirial. Lirial. Yeah. So I've read, yeah, I've read the three. The third one's just called Abhorsion. Yes. Right? And then there's the two novellas or short story books. And then there's Clarial and then Golden Hand. And I don't know if it's done or not. Um, I couldn't tell you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the second part of Sabriel by Garth Nix. We are done, Jill. We finished this section. We're going to do the next hundred pages or so. Well, probably six chapters. Yeah, let's so. look so that like last time I forced us so that our, if anyone's listening, they can try to read. Should be the line. end of chapter 18, 307. Wait, 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 what? 307. Yeah, we're going 13 to 18. I just like, I want to look at the end to see what, see if anything jogs my memory. I believe they arrive at Belisere. Okay. We're going to meet some more people. Yep. Yep, more characters. That's anyway, so that's that. Um, I don't know when we'll get to do this again, uh, but it will definitely be within the month or within a month. Uh, we will make it work. We will make it work. So anyway, Jill, why don't you say goodbye? Goodbye, everyone. Uh, I hope you listen to us again and read along with us. Yeah, do read along, actually. We're going to end on chapter... 18. 18. Yeah. So 13 to 18, get caught up if you can, leave comments, et cetera. And yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye.